That's the wrong way. So if we take a look at this picture real quick, um, our crystal violet will kind of bind in between here. And what I like to think of the iodine as doing is it takes these crystal violet molecules and it additionally helps to link them together. And in doing so, it makes really large complexes of crystal violet. And in doing so, it makes it even harder for them to exit that peptidyl glycan. So they actually kind of get like locked in to place almost. Um, why doesn't this happen with a gram negative? So why, why don't gram negatives stay purple? That's the wrong way again. No, no, it was right. Gram positive, gram negative, there we go. Is that? Okay. That's a big key characteristic to it, is the, gram, the, the peptidyl glycan is much thinner. Anything else? Jasmine? Can't they diffuse through it? What do you mean by that? Well, I guess maybe what is the it you're referring to? What? What's the it that you're referring to? Crystal violet? No. Is it the, if there's an outer membrane? Okay. Is that what you were going with? Okay. Um, the short answer is yes, but there, there's the short answer is yes, it can diffuse back out, but it doesn't, and we'll cover that in a second. Um, actually, let's just cover it right now. Let's start with just a quick contrast. What's different between gram positives and gram negatives? Outer membrane on. On negatives, what else? Porin proteins, and um, I, this picture makes it seem like there's only one porin protein. There are multiple ones. They usually go under the uh, abbreviation of OMP, OMP, or outer membrane protein, and then they have a letter after it. You can think of these as being involved in passive or facilitated diffusion of molecules. They are not... Um, for example, OMP-T allows for different molecules through it than does OMP-F, which is a much larger pore, allows for bigger molecules through. What else is different? LPS. The LPS. What's the LPS? Lipopolysaccharide. So that means what do we have in it? In polysaccharide, sugars, right? So the LPS... The LPS is only on the outer leaflet of the outer membrane of gram negatives. And, I, and there's really kind of two important parts, or two important features of it right now. One is the lipopolysaccharide can differ between sub, sub strain, or sorry, uh, between subspecies. So what I mean by that is E. coli is a species of bacteria. And then there are different, what we call serovars or subspecies like O26 or O157H7 or O121. The O there refers to a particular piece or a particular unique polysaccharide structure at the end of the LPS. So we can actually use the LPS as a way to distinguish subspecies between each other. That's kind of a clinical perspective. Um, and the LPS looks roughly like this. This is what we call the lipid A. Um, and then I'm just going to draw my polysaccharides like this. We have a core polysaccharide, and then the O antigen or the O polysaccharide is on the end of it. And this can be branched, but that O is specific to subspecies. The core polysaccharide is the same on all species, or on the species. Another important feature of this is, it's not really understood why, but the LPS is required for the organism to, uh, to live. So strains in which, that LP, in which the genes that create that LPS are knocked out, the cells don't survive. But we don't know why. Last thing, oh, this A right here, this lipid A, is also what we call an endotoxin. And we'll come back to that toward the end of the semester. Okay, so an important part of toxigenicity 
uh, at least for gram-negative species. Um, any other major differences? Obviously, the thickness of the peptidyl glycan. Uh, somebody, I, I don't know which class or, or which person it was, but in one of the uh, in one of the wikis, I put that on gram negatives, the peptidyl glycan makes up like ten percent of the envelope, whereas on gram positives, it makes up fifty to ninety percent of the envelope. Uh, so definitely a much more uh, big constituent part of the gram positives. What's the last thing up here? One more feature that's unique to gram positives. The, the, the tachoic acids. So there's two different types. There's lipotachoic acid and, um, and tachoic acid. The only difference between the two of them is where do they originate from. So what I mean by that is tachoic acid begins in the peptidyl glycan. Lipotachoic acid is actually bound in some way to the cell membrane. Um, these, again, are unique features to gram positives, and again, they have importance to survival and to growth, but researchers right now don't understand what that importance is. What is it actually doing? Um, so we use them more as kind of indicators in the same way that LPS can be used. Okay, so let's go back to that question on between positives and negatives. We've already said that the peptidyl glycan, the crystal violet, and the iodine help to lock in that crystal violet and leave gram, po gram positive staying purple. Why don't gram negatives stay purple? And I suppose part of it is that the, you could say that it's the diffusion of, of the crystal violet, but the crystal violet's still going to bind to the peptidyl glycan actually still going to bind here. And crystal violet is um, a hydrophobic molecule, so it can actually diffuse through the membrane and bind to that peptidyl glycan. What might be other reasons? Over? It's actually not so much that, because what you'll see, no, no, I, it, it was a good guess, all right? Uh, it's, it's not that. What we find is that the saffronin will um, even when we apply it to a gram-positive cell, it gets masked. So it's not that, like, it's not as if the saffronin replaces it, okay? I mean, the crystal violet is there at some point. Everybody remembers Wednesday we did simple stains. They will, it will stain a gram-negative cell. But why, when we add alcohol, does it get washed away? What's different between gram positives and gram negatives? Sarah? The uh, gram positive has the acid. Okay, that is a difference. Not the exact one I'm looking for. There's not as much peptidoglycan. Thank you. Not as much peptidoglycan. Okay. So in gram negatives, usually only one to three layers thick. Not as much of a meshwork of, of um, peptidoglycan there. There's a couple of things that actually happen that contribute to the de-staining. The first is because in gram negatives this peptidyl glycan isn't that thick, even after treating with iodine, it, there's not enough layers to completely trap that crystal violet. It still will remove itself from the peptidyl glycan uh, during the de-staining process. The second feature is the ethanol. And the ethanol actually has opposing effects on these two different cells. In gram positives, the alcohol uh, works in like a dehydration solvent. By adding alcohol to this, it removes some of the water that's bound to the peptidyl glycan, shrinks it, and helps to lock that crystal violet and iodine into the peptidyl glycan. In gram negatives, well, alcohol is a really good organic solvent. And it washes away or it degrades that outer membrane. And so when this outer membrane gets removed, that now leaves the possibility that this, uh, that the uh, crystal violet will actually 
not only come into contact with the ethanol, but now can diffuse away from it afterward. And again, the dehydration that's going to occur in the presence of ethanol here isn't enough to lock that crystal violet into place. So, gram yeah, sorry, I knew that was going to happen soon enough. Don't know if you've noticed, I'm very clumsy. I also have really bad ankles from playing years of soccer. Um, I have actually fallen into chalkboards before. Okay. Oh, and fainted while speaking in public. We can share that story later. All right. So what was I saying? Oh, so that dye, that dye diffuses away, gets washed away by the ethanol, and now we add that counter stain. What's the importance of this counter stain? Why, why, why use safranin, or why just use any stain at all after decolorizing? So you can see it, exactly. Those gram negatives otherwise are going to be translucent. You won't be able to see them very well under the microscope. So this helps to bring them out so that you actually can tell whether either A, the cells were gram stained, or B, you don't have cells actually on the slide. All right. Questions about the difference in structure here, kind of the basic principles of the gram staining itself. Jenna. So when you add the saccharin, yeah. does it attach to the peptidoglycan? Yes, it does. Yeah, I thought it was attaching to the alcohol. No, at that point, it's just attaching to the, yep, so it's just the peptidoglycan it's attaching to. Yeah, good question. And it's not strong enough to override the crystal violet, which is why when you have those gram positives stained with safranin afterwards, they're going to remain to the eye purple. Yeah. Um, one thing that, that I asked for on the table, and there was some confusion on this, so I want to make sure to cover this real quick, is which of these produces spores? So this is something we'll talk more about. We'll talk about the spore structure on Wednesday next week. Um, but between these two, gram positives are actually, we, I'm going to say most often we think of gram positives as being those that produce spores. There are a couple of um, species of gram negatives that will produce spores, but if you're trying to think of in general terms, gram positives do it. Um, the what spores are are basically just to kind of give a preview they're very resistant to environmental stress and they're actually produced as a product of environmental stress so when some bacteria stress or uh, sense stressful conditions such as lack of food high temperature um, alcohols, etc. What they will do is they will turn on genes that allow them to produce these spores. In the case of um, two major ones, the Bacillus genus and then also Clostridium, uh, which is home to Clostridium tetani, Clostridium botulinum, C. diff, all those. Uh, what Clostridium looks like is kind of like this, and then it's got a spore at one end. It's described as a club structure, typically. Uh, this spore will get produced inside that mother cell, and then that mother cell, when it lyses, re re, uh, releases that spore. Um, the importance of the spores is that they are incredibly resistant to these stressful conditions. So there are examples of spores that have been isolated from, or... I guess carbon dating puts them at about 30,000 years old. Researchers have brought them into the lab, and they will germinate and begin growing. Um, you guys may be too young to remember this, but there was an anthrax scare in the U.S. right after 9-11 back in 2001. Is everybody too young to remember? Vincent's looking at me like, what the heck am I talking about? <laughs> Once upon a time... Okay. So anthrax, Bacillus anthracis, is another organism that forms spores. And actually, it's the spores that cause the worst of the disease because they can be inhaled, unlike other forms of um, Bacillus anthracis, which if you get like a cutaneous infection, it's pretty easily cleared up. 
Um, so spores do have some importance there. All right. Um, oh, how do these differ from acid fast bacteria? So I'll leave out the gram positives. What is unique about acid fast? What's one defining characteristic? Mycolic the mycolic acid, yeah. And so that we find on all of these acid fast bacteria. It makes them resistant to uh, gram staining. This mycolic acid is waxy at room temperature. And so to be able to stain these cells, anybody know what, we ha what has to be done, Zach? Yeah, so you heat it, which liquefies those acids. Typically, we use a dye known as carbofuxin, um, which is just fun to say. So it's, if you're looking for the spelling, it's this, carbofuxin. And we liquefy, as Zach said, uh, the cells by heating them. Add the carbofuxin, snap cool it, which kind of uh, solidifies that wax, and then locks the carbofuxin into the cell. And that's the way that we can detect these acid fast bacteria. Um, just an inner membrane or a cell membrane, which is similar to gram positives. Peptidoglycan is not so well defined in this picture, but is usually a little bit, is kind of closer to the thickness of a gram positive than it is a gram negative. Um, and the mycolic acid, it, like a capsule, actually makes these organisms pretty resistant to phagocytosis. And so we'll come back to this later on, but this is the one of the reasons why, uh, for example, mycobacterium infections can be quite, uh, quite dangerous because our immune system can't do a great job at grabbing onto them and phagocytizing them. All right. We're, let's see, what else do I need to make sure we do? Okay, so did that. Let's do a review question. All right, so this question was inspired by last year's Super Bowl. Uh, I wrote the quiz with it, like, right after. So, at the Patriot, was at a Super Bowl party last February where the Patriots scored the last 28 points to win the game in overtime. He brought some of his favorite bacteria already heat fixed to slides to gram stain with his mascot friends. Because what, what party does not start with microbiology? Okay. In different ways, too. Beer is microbiology. Uh, in his excitement during the final touchdown, Pat spilled ethanol on the slides before he began to gram stain and didn't notice he had done so for five minutes. Did his mistake cost him the chance to perform a perfect gram stand and catch the eye of a special mascot Pat hoped to impress? All right. See, this is what I do with my mind. All right. So, the question essentially is, what happens if you spill ethanol beforehand? Is this going to have an effect on the end result of the gram stain? And consider this for a gram positive and gram negative. Um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about it and talk it over with somebody else before we, we discuss. I don't know. I don't. Uh, you tell me. We thought that it should still be the same no matter what both of them. Because if you rinse the ethanol off and there's no color on it already. Okay. And then you can stain it. So you're saying the ethanol would have no effect whatsoever then? Well, because the ethanol doesn't like stay inside her, does it? No. No, no it would get washed away. Right? Yeah. Okay. The ethanol for five minutes and it would create everything on the glass. It would wash all, all the cells. It doesn't affect the bacteria though. It only affects it affects the color. Right, but it all that all falls right down those things. For five minutes, That's I've a lost damn lost good, lost good lost. answer. That's the first time I've heard that one. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually. John said in lab that if you 
treated too long with ethanol, it's going to wreck your slide. So well, that's for like the gram stain. We're talking yeah, like wrecking it even beforehand. I didn't know if he didn't notice for five minutes or he was spraying it on there for five oh, minutes. Oh, no, he didn't notice. He didn't notice. No, it wasn't like he took a bottle of champagne and was like, no, no. Guys, this is totally hypothetical. I don't think this really didn't happen. There's no such thing as a mask out party. No, there are. There are. There are, of course. Okay. It's not one where they go Right. No, well, okay, no. Okay. So there are a couple of ways you could take this. And, and so one way you could say is it has no effect whatsoever. Because what it's going to do is remove that outer membrane, but the outer membrane doesn't really have too much of a role in determining a gram negative being a gram negative. Matt, your point to like the cells being degraded is actually a really good point. I've not heard that one before. And it makes sense. Like logically, it makes sense. Let's test it. You could. So, so I, I'm going to keep that one in mind too. Would anybody say that the gram negatives would, or sorry, the gram positives would appear negative? What if you did say that? What might you use for your argument? That, the fact that, the black down a little bit? that could be one potential answer. What else did we say the ethanol does to the peptidoglycan? How? How? Removing water. It dehydrates the peptidoglycan. So you could make the argument that the iodine, you could make the argument that the iodine doesn't even get into the peptidoglycan because it's already dehydrated, okay? Now, what's the right answer? There isn't one. Bingo. <laughs> there isn't a right answer because I, I really have no clue. There probably is. I just don't know what it is. Why ask this question then? What's that? Well, that could be one reason. What else? There's a football game today. That, that, <laughs> fair enough. The reason why I ask a question like this is to reiterate a point that I made the first day. Um, and that is that what's important in here is good critical thinking. Um, you don't have to have all the time the right answer. This one, there is no right answer. But what I want to see are logical arguments based on what we've talked about, using the principles that we've talked about to help support your answer. Okay, so Matt went off the point of, well, we said that the alcohol is going to degrade the membrane, so it's probably going to wash out both the outer and the inner membrane, too, if it's allowed to sit for a long enough period of time. Others made the point of, well, it's really not going to have much effect on the peptidoglycan, so you're still going to get positives and negatives because if you're going to still do the whole gram stain afterwards, that's perfectly fine. Somebody this morning made the argument of it'll still work, just the colors won't be as bright because of the dehydration of the peptidoglycan. And actually, this morning, three different people gave three different responses all based on the, the dehydration of the peptidoglycan. There's not one single right answer to this one. It's how do you go through thinking about it, okay? And that's what gets valued is how do you critically think about this? How do you use that knowledge, all right? This was not a test question. It was a quiz question. Anybody get frustrated by it? Anybody want to know if Pat found love? <laughs> all right. Um... Let's jump ahead and do one more uh, thought experiment for today. This actually leads in really nicely to what we're going to what we're going to begin to do on Wednesday, uh, and then with a with the remaining time, I'll just kind of cover a couple of last minute notes for the week. Um, I want to go back to the structure of gram positives and gram negatives, and I'm going to tell you a story here about. Uh, Alexander Fleming. Anybody know what Fleming's known for? Penicillin. So he is the one that basically left the plate out, went on, on uh, holiday, as they call it in England, and 
came back and there was mold growing and then bacteria wouldn't grow around that mold and voila, discovery penicillin. Before he started working with penicillin though, Fleming was working with an enzyme known as lysozyme. It's in your tears, it's in your mouth, um, other bodily secretions, it's found there too. It's, ba it's basically ubiquitous on the human body. Lysozyme uh, is a particular enzyme that hydrolyzes NAG and NAM. What WTF does that mean, right? So when I say hydrolyze, what do we mean there? Going back to a concept from last week. Zach? Breaking something. Good. Breaking what? Hydro. Water. Water. So using water to break a bond. Hydrolyze is essentially saying that a hydrolysis reaction is taking place. So this enzyme uses water and breaks a bond. What does NAG and NAM refer to? Good. It refers to the peptidyl glycan. I kind of mentioned that at the beginning. So um, in this structure here, these polysaccharides are repeating units of NAM or N-acetylmuramic acid and N-acetylglucosamine. And the brown is NAM, and I know this only because uh, to the N-acetylmuramic acid are associated these peptides that create these links between those individual poly, uh, polysaccharide chains. Okay? So, go ahead, Zach. Great question. Um, imagine, I don't want to address this. I'm trying to think of an analogy here, but imagine you have, um, imagine you have three pieces of wood, two by fours, okay? Uh, they're all parallel to each other, right? And would you agree that you can slide those pieces of wood independently of one another? Okay, imagine those as your polysaccharides. So just having those polysaccharides around the cell, they would be able to slide independently of one another. Now what if we start to put a drop of glue at random locations in between those pieces of wood? Now what happens? They're going to get stuck, right? They don't move independently anymore. In other words, we've added some structural rigidity to those three pieces of wood. That's what these peptides do. So the polysaccharides provide, I like to think of it as they provide lateral strength, and then the longitudinal strength is provided by the amino acids there, the, by the covalent bonds in between them. Does that help? Yeah, that's a great question, though. So... Lysozyme hydrolyzes between NAG and NAM. What's that going to do to a gram-positive cell? So if we say that it hydrolyzes this, what we are saying is essentially these covalent bonds, they're going to be broken. What's that going to do to the cell? Or what does that do to the peptidyl glycan? It breaks it up. Good. And then what happens to the cell is dependent a little bit on where is it found. So has anybody, just for the sake of it, taken blood and thrown it into pure water? Why wouldn't you? It's awesome. What happens? Take a red blood cell, put it into pure water. What's that? What do you mean by disperses? Like, does like all the red blood cells disperse out like that? Are you talking about like an individual one? Or like sure, just an individual red blood cell. Put one blood cell, red blood cell into water. Is the water going to rush into it? Water's going to rush into it. You guys are using the process of osmosis. Love it. And then what happens? It explodes. It bursts, right? Hydrolysis. Why does it burst? Well, essentially, red blood cells have a membrane. They do not have any sort of cell wall around them. And so that cell continues to swell and swell and swell. And if it can't control in some way that water, it's going to explode, right? 
Bacteria, on the other hand, in pure water, are not going to explode, or they do so less frequently. These gram-positive cells have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan, and so it's the same way that a plant cell would be in water. It swells, but that cell wall there prevents the cell membrane from expanding any further, creating some turgor pressure. Okay? So if we, let's say we have a bunch of bacillus anthracis in water, then we add lysozyme to it. Now what happens to those cells? So add lysozyme, break down that cell wall. Then osmosis occurs. Then osmosis is occurring. Those cells will swell. Peptidoglycan now is too weak to help uh, prevent that turgor pressure from, from bursting outward. Cells will explode. Okay. Uh, and Fleming's idea was essentially, use, let, let's use lysozyme as an antimicrobial. This is a great natural tool to kill microorganisms. It's a caveat, though. Is lysozyme going to work here? Is it going to work on a gram-negative bacteria? They have peptidoglycan. So will it work? So what's, what, what is one distinct feature of gram negatives? They've got an outer membrane. And what did we say about membranes? They are what? Semi, semi-permeable, semi right? And so a protein is large. It's bulky. Lysozyme is highly hydrophilic as well. Um, not only can it not get through that outer membrane, but those porin proteins, are, they are proteins themselves. The, the pore on the inside here, we're talking on the order of, oh gosh, 8 to 16, eh, 0.8. Is that right? Yeah, 0.8 to 1.6 nanometers in diameter. Uh, the lysozyme protein itself is going to be more like on the order of, oh, 10, 15 nanometers in diameter. It's too large to even fit through that pore. And so because of that, lysozyme and gram negatives, they will not lyse in the presence of lysozyme. That, that lysozyme is, pre, pre, is prevented from even getting to that peptidoglycan. Now, there are ways we can mechanically allow this to happen. If, for example, we added ethanol to disrupt that outer membrane and then added lysozyme, yes, those cells can be, ly can be uh, lysed, but not with just lysozyme alone. Okay. This becomes a really good conversation piece for Wednesday when we talk more about the membrane, talk more about transport across the membrane, uh, and then spend a little bit of time with just turgor pressure and hypertonic and hypotonic solutions as well. So with that said, any last questions on gram-positive, gram-negative, acid-fast bacteria? Okay, so a couple of things. Um, the first one, apparently I have a meeting in 15 minutes. Uh, number one, homework for... Wednesday, Wednesday. It's actually a two-parter, um, and, and some of this we've already addressed today, but um, part one's due Tuesday, part two's due by Wednesday, and I will remind you of that, um, and let me show you what these two parts are. This is an individual journal entry, so the only people that see this are yourself and me, and that's it. Um, the first part is to answer this question in black here, and then... Uh, so typical concentration of sodium chloride in a red blood cell is 0.9. What happens when it's put into a solution of 0.1% NaCl? Is the solution hypertonic, isotonic, hypotonic relative to the, to the cytoplasm of the red blood cell? The second part that's in blue here, you'll answer after class on Wednesday. Okay, so you have between end of class on Wednesday and midnight to answer that second part. 
Now, here's the other thing that I would like. Believe it or not, we're almost halfway through this first unit, okay? Actually, Wednesday marks like that tipping point. Um, so what that means is that our first exam uh, is coming up still. It's a couple of weeks away, uh, but I do want to give you a fair heads up of that. And one of the things that I want to start figuring out is, is this format of class working? Okay. I, one of the things I said I wanted to get, because this is a new way to teach this class for me, how's it working for you? So I want to know the following, and again, be, be brutally honest with this. Are you keeping up with the expectations? In other words, are you keeping up with the homework? Are you keeping up with watching those mini lectures beforehand? Second, what have you found to be beneficial for you in this course? So what are some beneficial aspects of how this is being run? And then any other feedback, concerns, et cetera. Okay? And again, be honest with us. Uh, remember, it's cheerocracy in here. So you get a voice. I decided. I, I ultimately will decide, though. Two last things. I will say from my perspective, For both the morning section and this section, uh, I have to say that these have been the most engaging classes I've had yet here. Um, last year, I don't know if people know my story, but you can read it if you want to. Uh, but last year sucked. So it was, it was rough. Uh, it was my first year here, and that was new and tough experience to, to kind of learn. And then we were going through stuff at home as well. And so... Um, I, I went home on Wednesday. I was actually smiling, and my wife asked what was wrong. Um, <laughs> she might have thought I was drinking. But, <laughs> but it was just nice to go home and talk about like how well things are going in here for me right now. So I thank you guys for the, for the effort that you're putting in. I really appreciate it. I think, it's, I think from my end, what I see is the stuff that I'm teaching you this semester is way beyond what we were doing last semester in this course or even last year in this course. So you guys are doing a great job. Last thing, enjoy the game if you're going to watch it tonight. Good luck to our sports teams. Have a safe weekend. I'll see you on Wednesday. Bye. I'm about to be live. This is my last class of the day. I'm about to go take a nap, go fix my nails. It's lit. We live. So if you knew, so if you knew it was a great question, what I would say is all you need to see. Yeah, you know it. I'm with you. We can go take our shower. <laughs> yeah. I think we might, you know. Yeah, I know. We said he said he spent on the plant. He said he said he spent on the plant. He said he said he spent on the plant. Otherwise, if you just want to like say, "Yep, they're there," simple stain on Crystal Bile, and that's it. Cool, thanks. Yep. So, what does hydrolysis have? This and yeah. On the peptide glycan. Yeah. Uh, is it what what ends up holding it together longer? Or just the peptide chains in between? And those are only on the mag. So, so you're saying during the hydrolysis itself? Yeah. If if we sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. You, you. So during the hydrolysis itself, if and if, and if we've added lysozyme mm -hmm. as well. Okay, so those those nag and nam are broken down. So you're asking what's actually still holding this right? Together. Because the hydrolysis is coming in and it's breaking the uh, right the hydrogen bonds. I right, they are between the nag and the nam. Well, actually, those would be covalent bonds. I guess they are. They w those would be covalent bonds. So what it's what it's breaking are a couple of things. One is. Hold this up real quick. I guess it's not um, one would be, and it cuts. In, it doesn't cut in between each nag nam. It's it's either it cuts in twos. So it cuts like here, here, 
here. So you have two held together, but yeah, it's really those... So it's those peptide chains that are... are going to be holding it together. Okay. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. Yeah. I'm senior year of biochem, so I'm thinking a little differently. Your Luisa's student that... Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. She was, she was telling me that somebody was in here as a senior biochem student. I, yeah. Got it. 